Hi. It gives me great pleasure today to carry on our series with 1 Kings. And I'm going to look in particular at King Asa of Judah. And you can find that in 1 Kings 15. It says in verse 9, In the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Asa began to reign over Judah. And he reigned for 41 years in Jerusalem. Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as David his father had done. It describes how he gets rid of the male cult prostitutes, the idolatry, that he, he, he uh, removes his mum from being the, the royal queen mother because she had committed idolatry. And he removed her, her statue and burnt it. And then he goes on to say that Asa was wholly true to the Lord all of his days. And we see that in verse 14. It says in verse 15, he brought into the house the Lord all the sacred gifts of his father, his own sacred gifts of silver, gold and other vessels. This is a man who's going for it. This is a man who's seeking after the things of God and is taking the nation with him. But then in verse 16, we find this really odd story where it describes how the king of Israel comes against Judah he builds a city on the border so that he can stop people from going in and out. Essentially, he closes the border to, to Judah, uh, not allowing any trade and any, you know, people to move from one place to another. So what does Asa do? Surely as someone where it says his, uh, the heart of Asa was wholly true to the Lord all his days. Surely someone who's like that is going to cry out to God for deliverance, who's going to put his trust in the Father in heaven. But no, what we see is that Asa actually uh, takes all the, the sacred items, items from the, the temple and he takes his own gold and he sends it off to the king of Syria and says, break your covenant with Israel, make a covenant with me, attack Israel so that I may be liberated. Instead of trusting in God, like we would expect, he's, he's taken his eyes off God and focused on, on, on you know what's happening and has made a covenant with a king who he shouldn't have made a covenant with you know god told the israelites when they moved into the promised land trust me and don't make you know don't don't trust in the people around you but trust in me as the lord your god and asa clearly hasn't done that if you want to find out more about this story and what happens uh, we need to look in two chronicles so i'm actually going to look at two chronicles i'm going to tell you a little bit more about asa so first of all, in 2 Chronicles 14, we actually see that when Asa is at the very start of his reign, that Zerah the Ethiopian comes out to him with an army of a million men and 300 chariots. Asa went out to meet him in battle. And what does Asa do? He cries out to God. It says, And Asa cried to the Lord his God, O Lord, there is none like you to help between the mighty and the weak. Help us, O Lord God, for we rely on you. And in your name we have come against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Let not man prevail against you. And what do we see happen? The Lord defeats the Ethiopians and they flee. Clearly at the start of his reign, he's trusting in God. He's cried out to God and seen a mighty victory. Now this battle with uh, Israel comes at the very end of his reign. If you remember, he reigned for 41 years. And this is what 2 Chronicles 16 says. In the 36th year of his reign, Basha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and built Ramah, that he might permit no one to go out or come in to Asa. So we've, we've gone from trusting in God at the start of his reign to having a problem and trusting in a nearby king um, at the end of his reign. It becomes quite clear that at some point, probably as a gradual change, but at some point Asa has taken his sight off the living God, the Father in heaven, and has put his sight elsewhere. And what do we see happen? Well, yeah, the, the, the king of Syria does attack Israel and Israel, Israel calls off its uh, siege. They go away and, uh, and uh, Asa, essentially, he's got what he wants. He's, he's got delivered from the battle. But in verse 7 of chapter 16, it says this, At that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa king of Judah and said to him because you relied on the king of Syria and did not rely on the Lord your God the army of the king of Syria has escaped you were not the Ethiopians and the Libyans a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen yet because you relied on the Lord he gave them into your hand and this is the key bit for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. 
You have done foolishly in this, and from now on you will have wars. Now, when a, when a rebuke came to King David many, many years earlier, what does David do? He puts on the sackcloth and ashes, he humbles himself, he, he repents, he seeks God. And uh, what does Asa do? Then Asa was angry with the seer and put him in stocks in prison, for he was in a rage with him because of this. And Asa inflicted cruelties upon some of the people at that time. Asa's clearly stepped away from the things of God. He's taken his eyes off the loving father and put them somewhere else. And uh, yeah, I haven't got time to go into this now, but it, it's often the case that if we know the father, if we know Jesus and we have a relationship with him and then, you know, tragically we walk away from that. Often the state that we're in is worse than we were before we'd even known him. Peter 2 Peter 20 does, sorry, 2 Peter 2 verse 20 does talk a little bit about that. And that's what we see here. Asa's clearly known God, he's clearly trusted in him, but he's taken his eyes off. And as the rebuke has come from the prophet, he's, he's gone into a rage because he, he's missing that love of the father. He's missing that intimate relationship that he once had. And instead of going back to him in humility and forgiveness and repentance, he's gone into rage. In fact, we see a bit more about Asa and how far he's gone away from God as we carry on through the chapter. In the 39th year of the reign of Asa, he was diseased in his feet, and the disease became severe, yet even in his disease he did not seek the Lord. We see that Asa has taken his eyes off God and put his eyes on the problem. And I think this is so key for us, especially at this time in which we live now, but just in general. And the challenge I want to give is where is your focus? Where is my focus? So when a problem comes, and yes, problems do come, problems come all the time. Is our eye fixed on the loving father in heaven or is our eye fixed on the problem? If our eye is fixed on the loving father in heaven, on Jesus who died for us, the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, then we will see the problem as he sees it. And to God, our problems, they're not big things, they're small things. Yeah, Jesus said himself, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, go into the sea and it will do it. To God, our, our problems are only small things and we need to have his view of the challenges that we face. And we can come into that place by keeping our eyes fixed firmly upon him and only upon him. It doesn't mean we ignore the problems, but it means we see it from his perspective. However, if we fix our eyes on the problem, if we focus in on the problem, that problem will gradually get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and it will consume us just in the same way that Asa fixed his eyes on this, this fact that the country was being held to ransom essentially by Israel. And instead of going to God, he, he, he was so focused on the problem that he, he sent these, the sacred treasures from the temple to a false, uh, to a foreign king and, and trusted in him. And this is, this is really important to us. Keep our eyes fixed on him. What could the problems be? What could the things that we face be? Well, you might be struggling with, with ill health. Well, what do we see in Mark 6? We see that as Jesus walked through the, the towns, all the people brought the sick to him. And as he reached out and touched them, so they were healed. If you're ill, if you're sick, don't be anxious about that, but trust in God. Cry out to him and, uh, and, and, and ask for the healing. And you might say to me, yeah, but that's Jesus walking around. But if we look in Acts 5, we'll see the same thing happens with Peter. As Peter's walking around, people are bringing out the sick and laying them on the ground so that even his shadow might pass over them. And it says, and all the people were healed. You know, Jesus wants us to live in health. So if you're wrestling with ill health at the moment, can I encourage you, don't focus on the problem. I'm not saying to ignore it, but don't focus on the problem, but fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on the Father and seek him for his healing. At this time of, of COVID, it's a tragedy that companies are going bankrupt and people are losing their jobs. If you're worried about your security and your finances, what do we see in Scripture? Well, we see in Philippians 4 uh, an exchange between Paul and the Philippians. And he says, <coughs> they, they've clearly sent him a gift and he's thanking them for the gift. But he says in verse 19, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. 
And he goes on to say, to our God and Father be glory for ever and ever. Amen. God's going to help us if we keep our eyes fixed on him, if we give to the poor, if we support the work of the church, if we if we're generous with what we have, God will meet our needs. And remember, that's needs. It doesn't necessarily mean all the things we want, not a flash car or anything like that, but he will meet our needs. And this is something that Sally and I can relate to as I lost my job a few years back. We can relate to the provision of God. Every need has been met as we've looked to him and fixed our eyes upon him. The third one I want to mention is is our children. We've got two boys. They've not been at school since March. Yeah, they're doing their online learning. It would be really easy for me as a former deputy head teacher, it'd be really easy for me to be like really anxious. You know, what's going to happen to their exams? What's going to happen to 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 their career and their future prospects with the fact that they've missed all this school? Will they catch up? The Bible tells us in Matthew 6 and Matthew 19. First of all, Matthew 19, we see the story about the children coming to Jesus. It says, the children were brought to him that he may lay his hands on them and pray. That's Jesus. And the disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Jesus loved having the little children. He had time for little children. And it says he laid his hands on them and they went away. Matthew 6, we'll see within verses 25 and 34, we see that a very clear message from Jesus. Do not be anxious. Let's not worry about our own source, our own provision, our own life. Let's trust in him. But let's also apply that to our our children. Let's put that into our children and tell our children, you know, let's not be anxious about the future. Yeah, you've missed six months of school, but God is greater than the COVID, the COVID lockdown. God is greater than the schooling that you've missed. And God is more than capable of, through divine, miraculous ways of filling your head with the things you need to know so that your future is secure in him. So as we face the challenges that life is currently throwing at us, whether it be ill health, whether it be uh, finance and job security, whether it be about our children or any other challenge that you may be facing at the moment, fix your eyes upon Jesus. Fix your eyes upon the Father in heaven and you will see the problems from his perspective. Now, the final thing I want to say is how do we do that? And the solution is surprisingly simple. And there's two things here. First of all, repeat positive scriptures to yourself. When you're faced with a challenge, speak the truth of scripture over the challenge. So if you're worried about your job, speak the truth of Matthew 6 about how God's provision is there. If God loves the flowers in the field and the birds of the air, how much more does he love us and will provide and meet all of our needs? Speak the truth of Malachi as I place my tithes and offerings into the storehouse so God will pour out the wonders from heaven and prevent the devourer from eating our crops. Speak the truth of scripture over yourself. You could say to me, ah yeah, but Keith, you're talking there about mind over matter and that's not going to work. No, I'm not talking mind over matter. I'm talking faith in Jesus over flesh. Faith over flesh. Faith over the the worldly stuff. And the second thing is this. If we want to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus when it comes into the dealing with the challenges, we need to stay in his presence. You know, many of us, we're, we're busy with all that's going on. I work from home. So when I'm doing a phone call... I can pray before the phone call instead of having like just a a brief quarter of an hour and compartmentalizing God in a 15 minute quiet time, which is good. And don't get me wrong. I think that's great that we give time to God. But let's actually let's just incorporate God and the Holy Spirit within us into the whole day. So when I'm doing a phone call, let's pray. Let's just engage with the Holy Spirit. When I'm on a gap between phone calls, let's engage with the Holy Spirit. When I'm making a cup of tea, I'm going to engage with the Holy Spirit. When I'm cleaning my teeth in the morning, engage with the Holy Spirit. Uh, When I'm doing my hair, which is getting a bit long, I'm engaging with the Holy Spirit. And as we spend our time in his presence, so our eyes will be fixed upon him and problems will be they, 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 you know, it's not I'm saying they're not there, but our problems will be we'll see them as he sees them. And the eyes of faith will see the solution come. So don't be bound by your challenges. 
Trust in God. Trust in Jesus. Fix your eyes upon him and you will see the provision of God in all things. Thank you.